We'll start, sir. We can start, I think. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Department of Medicine uh, Academic Feast. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. George Ronsar again. Uh, we'll continue with our series on lectures, critical care lecture series. Today will be our lecture on respiratory physiology and uh, respiratory failure part one approach. So uh, we had our uh, lectures on uh, arterial blood gas part one, simple and mixed acid-base abnormalities taken by Sir last week, and had a we had our like uh, series of questions also provided to us and then question answers also later on. Hoping that everyone has done, gone through it and then have some doubts. Please uh, feel free to ask questions to Sir. He will be now discussing maybe uh, the five questions or the twenty questions forwarded. Um, so any quest, uh, doubts, please. You can uh, you can message us to unmute yourself and or, or you can put down in the chat box. These lectures will anyways be recorded and soon uploaded on our Department of Medicine YouTube website. Uh, thank you, sir, again uh, for agreeing to take this lecture for us. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all see the screen. Yes, sir. Yeah. The plan is to uh, start off with the first five questions of the ABG quiz. Every session starting this session. So we have five today, five tomorrow. Next week, there are no sessions. So following week, we have the two sessions on shock when we will finish the 11 to 20 of the ABG questions. Couple of things, uh, the initial set of answers I sent and the second set, there were a few errors. So I've sent the third set today, which will be distributed to you. And uh, there were some typos and some errors. And one of the things was I had put the ABG CO2 to take normal as 35 to 55, 35 to 45. And we will discuss the answers in order. And let us see if you have any doubts, we can try to sort it out. Okay, we start with the ABG, then move on to the lecture. So this is the first uh, ABG, patient with cough, fever, and dyspnea for three days. And I hope we've all done the answers. So the first diagnosis will be respiratory failure type 1 because the person is hypoxic. PF ratio is low because in 100% oxygen, the PO2 51 is low. CO2 is lower than the range, so she's, he's, he or she is hyperventilating. And the base axis is negative, so you have a mild metabolic acidosis. So that is the answer for question one. You can check and see what your responses have been like. We can sort out doubts either now or later or any session, even the last two sessions, we can sort it out. Question two. Patient is a chronic smoker coming with an exacerbation of dyspnea, found to have a low SpO2 on oxygen therapy, increasing drowsiness. So second patient's diagnosis, first is acute respiratory failure type two because the CO2 is high and the PO2 is low. Person also on 100% oxygen, so low PF ratio, got a respiratory acidosis and a metabolic acidosis. Patient three, obese patient with increasing drowsiness. Looking at the values, he's got an acute on chronic respiratory failure, but person is on 100% oxygen, but he's not hypoxic. But we still diagnose respiratory failure because on, it is diagnosed on the basis of room air. I'll deal with that in the, second, the rest of this lecture. He's got a low PF ratio got a respiratory acidosis and a metabolic alkalosis. Patient four, patient on accident, multi-trauma, oxygenation is, well, if at all, it's high. The PF ratio is less than 300. On 50% or 0.5, it should be 150 at least. Hyperventilating, maybe is in pain, he's got respiratory alkalosis and a metabolic acidosis. Patient five, hyperglycemic patient with fever and shock. This patient has got uh, 
normal oxygen, pH ratio is okay. Then room air, this PO2 is 81, and the metabolic acidosis, quite significant. But the CO2 is within range for that because we look at the two digits of the pH after the decimal point, it's 14, his PCO2 is 15, which is well within the range expected. So it's a single disorder. Any feedbacks uh, now, or you can do it at the end of the lecture, or we can proceed on to the lecture. So those are the questions and the answers for the first five questions. You can either do it in this session or the next session tomorrow, whatever you want. Uh, no feedbacks as of now, sir. So, right. but, uh, That's fine. We'll proceed to the lecture. It can come so in during the lecture. So the second part of diagnosis explanations will you be just providing, sir. No, but that is uh, straightforward. Well, metabolic acidosis, based on the last lecture, you've got a base excess, which is negative. No, no, the previous, previous four patients. Previous four patients, wherever there's a negative base excess, this comes to as a metabolic acidosis. I mean, uh, the, uh, the clinical scenario for the possible acidosis. No, we haven't said the cause for the acidosis. That's okay. uh, not going into. We're just making a diagnosis on the blood gas. Okay, okay, sure, sir. So, causes for the acidosis in a patient with. Uh, Multiple injuries could be anything from myoglobinuria to renal failure with acidosis to shock with the renal failure. So I don't think that can be diagnosed just on the basis of a one-line history. Sure, sure. So we are just sticking to the blood gas diagnosis and the causes of those things we, is not dissectable with that amount of information. Sure, sir. But if somebody wants to discuss the possibilities, I'm quite happy to do that. But we are sticking to the ABG diagnosis, starting with the scenario Deciding whether it's likely to be respiratory or metabolic, looking at the numbers and then making a decision. As to what has caused it, we don't have enough information in the history to give, give that information. But if anybody wants to discuss it, I'm quite happy to do that. So shall we proceed to the uh, main uh, body? Sure, sir. Okay, this is some respiratory failure, some key concepts. The second part tomorrow will deal with uh, the management of respiratory failure. Now, failure of any organ system is defined as the inability of that system to meet the needs of the body. Since the function of the respiratory system is to maintain oxygen and remove carbon dioxide, obviously a failure, a respiratory failure implies that either oxygenation is impaired or carbon dioxide excretion is impaired. So, you diagnose respiratory failure based on a test. It is not just a clinical diagnosis. So, respiratory failure hypoxemia is defined as PO2 less than 60 on room air. This is important to know because if a person has got a PO2 on 100, on 100 percent oxygen, he is not hypoxic, but he is still considered to be in respiratory failure because on 100 percent oxygen or an FiO2 one, his PO2 should be much higher than that. <coughs> so keep that in mind when you diagnose respiratory failure. It is diagnosed as a person having a PO2 of less than 60 on room air. You don't actually have to put the patient on room air. You can use the PF ratio and calculate it and see that the person is got likely to have a PO2 less than 60 on 21% oxygen. He has got oxygenation failure. Hypercarbia is defined PSO to more than 45 millimeters mercury for practical purposes taken as 50. But the decision on whether that elevated value needs treatment will depend on other factors like the sensorium, the chronicity of the CO2, the change in pH. So just because CO2 is high doesn't necessarily mean it needs treatment. It might, but not just on the basis of the number. Now, going on to a basic law of physics for gases, we need to understand it so that we can do a few calculations down the line. The total pressure exerted by a mixture of dry gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressure of each individual gas. In other words, we have gas A, B, and C. The total pressure is the addition of the pressure due to A, B, and C. And remember, this refers to dry grasses. So if you take the atmospheric pressure as 760, you always need to subtract the water vapor pressure at body temperature from that to get the dry atmospheric pressure. 
and then you can apply Dalton's law. The uh, water vapor pressure at 37 degrees centigrade is 47 millimeters mercury. So you subtract that from 760, you get 713. You can round it out to 700 if you want to calculate it much more easy in your head. Now there's a reverse of this law. That is if you have a mixture of gases and you know the total pressure, you can ex calculate the pressure exerted by each component if you know the fraction of each component. If a total pressure is 500 and fraction A is 50%, the fraction A will be exerting 250 millimeters mercury pressure. <coughs> so keep this <coughs> Dalton's law and this reverse uh, application in mind. Let us look at a functional <coughs> diagram of the respiratory system. You have the electrical part, the center for respiration and its nerve connections, the conducting tubes, which is basically dead space, but there is no gas exchange. Pulmonary parenchyma, which the alveoli, which is the gas exchanger, <coughs> the diaphragm and chest cage, which is the respiratory pump, and the pulmonary circulation, which takes the gas or brings in carbon dioxide. And you can have a respiratory failure depending on, on each of these components. <coughs> Excuse me. You can have a respiratory standard depression or a neuropathy. You can have an airway obstruction. You can have VQ abnormalities. I'll deal with this a bit later. You can have chest wall abnormalities or muscle dysfunctions. You can have problems in the pulmonary circulation. So you can have various types of causes for respiratory failure depending on which component fails. Now, some basic facts about oxygen. Our body needs 250 ml of oxygen per minute in the basal state. It will go up if you are actually in a hyperdynamic state or you are septic or if you are exerting. The venous PO2 is 40. The arterial PO2 is 90. Inspired air percentage of oxygen is 21. That, using Dalton's law, exerts a partial pressure of 150. Expired air has got a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 to 110. 16% is the expired air. The carbon dioxide production is 200 ml per minute in basal state. Venous PCO2 is 46. Arterial is 40. PCO2 expired air is same as arterial because it equilibrates quite rapidly. Inspired air has got hardly any carbon dioxide. A few <coughs> basic definitions. The breath rate, the number of breaths you take per minute, it has an inspiratory and an expiratory phase. The volume inhaled or exhaled is the tidal volume. And the minute ventilation is a tidal volume multiplied by the breath rate. So if one takes 500 ml of tidal volume, breathe 10 times a minute, the total minute ventilation is 500 into 10, that will be 5 liters. <clears throat> now these are the lung volumes. I'm not going to go into it in detail. What is essential for the sick patient is to look at the FRC. That is the functional residual capacity. That's the amount of air remaining in the lungs at end expiration. That is the FRC. Now the FRC will get reduced if you have something compressing the lungs like a large pleural effusion or the lungs are stiffer, so it tends to collapse more. And why is this important? Because remember that breathing is basic. You have an inhalation and an exhalation. Blood flow is continuous. So if you just look at the cardiac output of five liters per minute, you will have a flow of blood from through the lungs of about 80 ml per second. Say the minute ventilation is 500 ml and 15 breaths a minute. So the minute ventilation is 7,500 ml. If you take a cycle of 15 breaths a minute, each respiratory cycle time is four seconds. 60 divided by 15. So four seconds per breath cycle. And the usual inspiration expression ratio of one is to two. That gives 1.3 seconds for inspiration and 2.7 seconds for exhalation. Remember, during this 2. seconds of exhalation, blood is still flowing through the lungs. 80 ml per second will give you about 210 ml of blood. And this has to be oxygenated. But there's no fresh gas flowing in. This oxygenation is done by the FRC. 
If your FRC is lower, you will start to desaturate. So that is the importance of FRC. I just want you to, to remember this because sick patients with sick lungs have lower FRC and you use a maneuver known as PEEP to keep the FRC up. Some more definitions and ideas. The tidal volume you take in may be 500 ml, as in the example just mentioned. But that 500 ml is distributed in two areas. One is the conducting airways, which don't do any gas exchange. The volume of the conducting airways is usually the weight of the person in pounds. Or if you want it in kilos, it'll be twice the weight in kilos. The alveolar ventilation is what exchanges gas. So you have to subtract the anatomical dead space from the total tidal volume to get what the volume reaches the alveolus. So in this particular instance, it will be 500 minus 150, that will be 350. So the alveolar ventilation is what matters in gas exchange. Dead space means there is no perfusion, no gas transfer. What is the physiological dead space? If you have an alveolus with very low perfusion or no perfusion, then it adds on to the anatomical dead space and is known as the physiological dead space. This is not a constant because it depends on the perfusion of the lungs, whether there's destruction of the capillaries. So it will dif it's different depending on the disease process. So there is no fixed value to it, but it adds on on top of the anatomical dead space. Now let's take oxygenation, carbon dioxide removal one by one. Your PiO2, inspired oxygen is 150. How do you get this? You get this by calculating it from the atmospheric dry pressure and multiplying it by the FiO2. Once it reaches the alveolus, it becomes 100 because the carbon dioxide is added in the alveolus. That becomes a mixture of gases. The veins bring in blood at 40 millimeters mercury pressure. The arteries go out almost the same as alveolar with a small difference. That is the AA gradient we mentioned in the ABG. So here's the calculation. Atmospheric pressure 760. Pressure of water vapor at body temperature is 47. Dry atmospheric pressure is 713. So PiO2 is 713 into 21 percent. That is 150 millimeters of mercury. Alveolar oxygen, capital A, is inspired oxygen minus carbon dioxide, which is taken to be same as arterial, but some taken the respiratory quotient because the volume of carbon dioxide which comes out is not the same as oxygen which goes in. So if you subtract that, you get an alveolar partial pressure of oxygen of 100. That's how we got 100 in the figure. The measured arterial oxygen is the small a, O2, that is 80 to 90. And there's a small gradient because of venous admixture, which never sees the oxygen, like the bronchial venous drainage and various alveoli, which are physiologically shunting. The relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen and the saturation is a sigmoid curve. And if it's 100% saturated, each gram of hemoglobin can bind 1.34 ml of oxygen. If it's only 50% saturated, it can bind only half of that, which is 0.67. So keep that in mind. I'll, we need more details about this in the lectures on shock. Let us now look at the carbon dioxide. The inspired air contains hardly any carbon dioxide. We'll take it as zero for practical purposes. Goes down to the alveolus, meets venous blood coming in at 46 millimeters mercury pressure containing carbon dioxide and equilibrates, carbon dioxide diffuses out and in the arterial side, it becomes 40. So the expired carbon dioxide is also 40. And remember using Dalton's law in inverse, if 40 millimeters mercury is a partial pressure of carbon dioxide, it occupies 5.6% of the total fraction of expired air, 40 by 713. We're still using Dalton's law. So keep that in mind, expired gas has a carbon dioxide between 5 to 6%. Now you can look up, look up on this as the body has a well of carbon dioxide. You have a bucket which can hold 5% carbon dioxide. The bigger the bucket, 
the bigger the means bigger the tidal volume the more carbon dioxide it can hold but only 5% whatever the volume it, it may be but in absolute terms if you take a larger tidal volume the total absolute amount of carbon dioxide you can bring out is larger and the number of times you dip the bucket into the well of carbon dioxide is the respiratory rate this is one convenient way to look at it so if you increase the size of the bucket or increase the number of times you dip it you are increasing minute ventilation and you are excreting more carbon dioxide the same thing if you look at it in a graphical form as the minute ventilation rises your carbon dioxide falls not a straight line it's a curve and it becomes parallel to the axis at its ends but in the physiological range it's almost a straight line and if you look at it if you divide the carbon dioxide production which i mentioned was 200 by the minute ventilation you should get the expected paco2 arterial carbon dioxide this is useful to remember because if there is a disparity between the expected carbon dioxide and the actual carbon dioxide it is due to one of two things either there is an increase in production of carbon dioxide more than 200 ml per minute or there is an increase in dead space that is your ventilation is being wasted without bringing out carbon dioxide now let us come to what i mentioned before the ventilation perfusion spectrum look at the middle diagram where you have an alveolus which is well ventilated and a vessel which is well perfused venous blood comes in goes out oxygenated and devoid of not devoid less of carbon dioxide that's an ideal ratio v is for ventilation q is for perfusion of 1 that's good but not everything in the world is ideal you have two ends of the spectrum at one end you have a vent alveolus which is collapsed perfusion is continuing and that is the definition of a shunt where the blood is flowing through the alveolus there's no ventilation and you have a shunt there the v by q is zero because v is zero zero divided by any number is still zero doesn't matter how much perfusion there is but between 1 and 0 you can have a lot of fractions so you can have partially collapsed alveoli 25% 50% 75% collapsed but that still is not a perfect matching of alveolus and perfusion so when it is not absolute zero you have a shunt effect comprising various fractions of vq between 0 and 1 on the other end of the vq spectrum you have a situation where the vessels are not perfusing the alveolus is ventilated and that as we have seen is dead space physiological dead space and v by q there is tending towards a very large number maybe well mathematically infinity because q is 0 tending towards 0 and you can have a large number of uh, abnormalities of high vq more than one which have various degrees of perfusion but not matching to the ventilation that is the dead space effect so you have this whole spectrum of alveoli distributed in the lungs which can account for a number of abnormalities let us see what happens when the vq is high your dead space is increased so there is a disparity between the minute ventilation and the co2 in other words you divide 200 by the minute ventilation then the minute ventilation is 10 you would expect the co2 to be 200 by 10 20 but now it is 40 it either means that the carbon dioxide production is increased or there is a lot of dead space in the lungs whatever be the cause the work of breathing is increased and that can lead on to respiratory fatigue so high vq alveoli contribute to dead space disparity between minute ventilation and pco2 and increase in work of breathing let us look at a low vq abnormality this is a alveolus which is collapsed venous blood is coming in with 46 mm mercury there is not enough oxygen in the alveolus to oxygenate the blood coming in so the po2 going out if it's totally collapsed it will be the same if it's partially collapsed some oxygen gets in maybe a slight rise the carbon dioxide also cannot go out because there's not enough volume of 
air in that alveolus to take up the carbon dioxide. So the CO2 also remains higher than it should be than with a fully open alveolus. But what actually happens? This is a crucial diagram. I'll spend some time on it. You have a normal VQ alveolus, which produces normal oxygen. You have a low VQ alveolus, which causes hypoxemia as well as hypercarbia. And the net result of mixing blood, which has normal oxygen and low oxygen, as it comes out from the pulmonary vein, is hypoxemia. But there is a difference for carbon dioxide. The hypercarbic blood flowing out to a low VQ alveolus can meet blood coming from a normal alveolus, which is hyperventilating. So, for instance, if you have hypercarbia, the CO2 of blood coming through a low VQ alveolus is 60. The normal alveolus, your person is hyperventilating, the CO2 is 20. You mix up equal amounts of that, the average would be back to 40. In other words, when you mix up low VQ alveolus, the carbon dioxide can be compensated for, for, for by hyperventilation, but you cannot compensate for the hypoxia because you cannot supersaturate oxygen. You can bring down CO2 to less than normal and make the average mixture look normal, but you cannot take up oxygen saturation above 100%. So it's a ceiling. So this is how you get type 1 respiratory failure, where the carbon dioxide is normal, but the oxygen is low. Let's look at the other, the shunt effect and the True shunt. If you look at a person with a partially collapsed alveolus, which is perfused, so that is person is getting hypoxic. If you increase the FiO2, the PiO2 also goes up. So you increase it from room air to 100%, the PiO2 goes up, or even 50%. So it goes up from 140 to 350. Now, what happens? Because there is more oxygen in the alveolus, you will find an improvement in oxygenation in response to your increased FiO2. So, if your hypoxia responds to administered oxygen, it means that oxygen is reaching the alveolus and getting transferred into the blood. If you remove the oxygen, it desaturates again, obviously because it's partially collapsed. But in the case of a shunt, where there is no ventilation at all, this will not occur because the administered oxygen cannot reach the alveolus, it's fully collapsed. So the absence of increase of saturation or oxygenation in response to an increase in administered oxygen tells you there is a shunt. And that's how it differentiate between low VQ and VQ of zero. It's important to understand this difference because low VQ you can treat by increasing the FiO2. Shunted blood, you have to use other maneuvers like recruitment maneuvers to open up the alveolus or peep to prevent the alveolar total collapse to improve oxygenation. So I'm just mentioning the physiology so you'll understand the physiological basis of using these maneuvers. So let us look at the causes of oxygen, low oxygen. Hypoxia is low oxygen as tissue level, hypoxemia, low oxygen in blood. But I'm not making the differentiation uh, very clearly here because uh, from a practical point of view, low oxygen in blood will cause low oxygen at the tissue level. So the first cause is low FiO2. Now this, if you're at sea level or in most of our uh, land, this will be 21%. But if you ever go up on a plane, it is pressurized. It may come down to 15%. If you're in a burning building, FiO2 may be lower because the fire consumes oxygen. It can be due to hyperventilation. When we say hyperventilation, we generally mean generalized hyperventilation. Person is not breathing adequately, like obstructive sleep apnea or an obese patient. It can be due to VQ mismatch, low VQs, which is focal hyperventilation. It can be due to shunt, which is basically no ventilation in some of the many of the alveoli. It can be due to diffusion defects. But remember, diffusion defects because of thickening of this interstitial space between the alveolus and the blood capillary is not the usual reason for hypoxia in an acute situation. 
In acute situation, is almost always due to VQ abnormalities. In chronic processes like interstitial lung disease, there the diffusion defects can be thought of as being a cause. But in acute situations, these are not. This is not a cause of hypoxia. A low cardiac output can amplify an existing problem because the blood returning into the pulmonary circulation will have an even lower PaO2. So more oxygen is needed to saturate it back to normal levels. Let us go on to carbon dioxide. When you ventilate a person with a tidal volume of 500 and a respiratory rate of 10 and an anatomical dead space of 150, the alveolar ventilation is 350 ml. This contains 5.6% carbon dioxide. Now, 5.6% of carbon dioxide is about 20 ml. So that 350 ml of the bucket you have put in has about 20 ml of carbon dioxide. Now, if you're breathing at a rate of 10, you can excrete 20 into 10, 200 ml of carbon dioxide. And that is the carbon dioxide production. So at that level of ventilation, that is 500 ml into 10, it's just enough to keep your PCO2 stable with a production of 200 ml per minute. But this 3,500 ml of alveolar minute ventilation has got about 700 ml of oxygen because oxygen is 21%. So if you drop your minute ventilation, the first thing to be affected is the CO2 will go up. There's enough oxygen there to maintain it for a little more time. So the CO2 going up is a very sensitive indicator of generalized hypoventilation. I hope this argument is clear. Think about it. So the CO2 is very crucial in terms of minute ventilation. If minute ventilation drops, the CO2 will go up. Now let us look at the types of respiratory failure. Based on pathophysiology, the classical way to divide it was type 1, hypoxia due to VQ abnormalities we had just discussed. Type 2, two gases abnormal, low CO, low PaO2 and high CO2. Somewhere about four or five years ago, Harrison brought in a classification with four types based on the etiology, alveolar flooding, alveolar hypoventilation, alveolar collapse, post-op patients and respiratory muscle hypoperfusion. So shock. If you look at type one and type two, type three, they both con contribute towards the original type one, low hypoxic type one respiratory failure. And type two and four will be with both the gases abnormal. So one is the classical definition where you just go by the abnormality you see. The second is based on pathophysiology as to what exactly is happening. This is just for you to understand why these two types of uh, respiratory failure has been expanded by Harrison into four. One is clinically useful, the other is a biochemical diagnosis. Now causes of respiratory failure for parenchymal lung disease, you can have a pneumonia, you can have pulmonary edema, ARDS, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary embolism, I'll come to this in a moment, asthma and COPD. One word about pulmonary embolism. One would expect, after all what I've discussed, that the pulmonary embolism would obstruct the vessels flowing into an alveolus and cause a high VQ. So the problem one would expect would be usually carbon dioxide retention because the dead space is increased. But in practice, you find that this hypoxia is a very, very common manifestation of pulmonary embolism. It's interesting to know why this happens. One, pulmonary embolism patients hyperventilate, they dissonate. So the CO2 does get washed off by the normal areas. But there is an even more interesting reason. Before the pulmonary embolism, there are two alveoli side by side, which are VQ01 and doing perfectly well. Till the embolism comes and obstructs one alveolus, which is no longer perfused. So this blood has to go somewhere else. And it actually diverts off to the normal part of the lungs, which has normal circulation. In other words, those circulatory channels dilate. And in addition, the infarcted lung releases 
cytokines which cause some amount of airway constriction, which is why you can hear ronchi and pulmonary embolism. And therefore, you convert a apparently high VQ on this side to a low VQ because there is over distension of the alveoli, or oh, sorry, of the vessels in the normal alveolus, and there's also a restriction of ventilation. So this is, this is the reason for the hypoxia and pulmonary embolism. Though at first glance, it looks as if it should only give rise to dead space. Hypoxia is a common clinical manifestation of pulmonary embolism, and this is the mechanism by which it is explainable. Type two respiratory failure, Think of large airway obstruction, neuromuscular disease, generalized hyperventilation like an obstructive sleep apnea, obesity with pic pic syndrome, large pleural effusion of pneumothorax, and end-stage lung disease. You can have type 1 progressing to type 2. If you have a person with type 1 respiratory failure, develops a pneumothorax, you can become type 2. I'm talking of the classical types. So primarily only hypoxia, then you start retaining carbon dioxide because of the pneumothorax. And of course, with the respiratory muscle fatigue, person will hypoventilate and the CO2 will start climbing up. And remember always, hypoxia is a medical emergency because hypoxic brain damage is irreversible. Time for questions. Part two is tomorrow, basically on respiratory support. I hope the physiology is clear. I will send the slides to you because this is has got a few more slides and explanation than the original one sent. So Anju will send it to you later today. I'll send it to her after this lecture. Thank you, sir. Any doubts, questions? We'll wait. Let them think it over. There's a lot of information on that. Even tomorrow is fine after thinking it through. You can avail these uh, presentations by mailing to medicine.cmcvalu.ac.in for the pre previous presentations and the EBG questions and answers. There is a question uh, for the pre EBG questions, sir. Sure, which one? I'll go back. Which question number? Question three, patient three and four. Question three and four. Yeah. Let me go back. Let's take question three first. Okay. Question is uh, sir, in the quiz, quiz in patient three and four is on the second. No, we'll take one patient at a time. Ah, so in both patient three. Uh, patient three is in the second metabolic disorder, a compensatory mechanism. We're looking at metabolic alkalosis, sixty-eight point eight. You have to calculate the expected amount of base excess, right? Mm -hmm. So the expected base excess, this is an obese patient. So you're starting with the respiratory end. So you're actually looking for how much of uh, CO2 you would expect to rise. So how much of base excess you would expect to rise for a CO2 rise to 68. Correct? Yes. Correct. Now, if you look at the base excess calculation I've given, is 0.6 into the rise in CO2. Assuming a CO2 is 18. Suppose you assume his initial CO2 was 50, the rise is 18, mm. and you multiply it by 60%, is it, it, it 60% of 18 would be around 10, and this is only 5. So it's absolutely right, it could be part of the compensation, And but the important thing to remember is that, therefore you define it as a chronic process, because in an acute process, you wouldn't find the base excess going up so high. Mm. Uh, does the candidate get the point? In a chronic process, the base excess would be high and the pH would not drop. In an acute process, the pH would drop and the base excess would not go up. So this is an acute process, huh? you're saying? This is acute on chronic probably. I'm saying it is chronic because the base excess is high. In an acute process, it should not change. Mm, yeah. Okay, so there is a chronic respiratory failure. I'm calling it acute because he's become acidotic. Yes. So I'm uh, telling there are two components to it. The chronic nature is because of the clinical history is obese patient and he's got a positive base excess, which tells me the compensation is taking place. So it's not an acute uh, process which is going on. Mm. Secondly, his pH has actually dropped, which means the CO2 has gone up higher than what it normally is for him. 
Otherwise, the base excess would have compensated. Sure. It have been 7.30 or 7.31, low limit of range. It is actually dropped below 7.30. Because it's in the acidemic range, I would say that this person has got an acute and a chronic respiratory failure. The pathological metabolic alkalosis is there contributing to that, sir? No, the metabolic alkalosis may be contributing it because if the pH was not changed, usually metabolic alkalosis contributes to it by buffering the pH so the person doesn't breathe. Mm. But here the person's pH is 7.284. He should respond to that. Mm. You get it? Sure, sir. Same thing has been asked for uh, question four also. Yeah, yeah. Let's finish the question three at the same time. Because huh. we're going to four. So question three, first, this patient is an obese patient with increasing drowsiness, expected to have a respiratory problem. Looking at the blood gases, I find that his base excess is positive, which mm. tells me it's a chronic process. Mm. If it's an acute respiratory failure, base excess should not change. Yes. Because it has changed, he's got a chronic process. If it's a chronic process, the pH has no right to change. Because the pH has changed, I would say it's an acute or a chronic respiratory failure. Yes. Okay, we go on to the next one. What is the question here? Again, uh, diagnosis 2, whether it's a compensatory mechanism. Yes, very good. So here, if you look at it, in comparison to the previous patient, the pH is high. The previous patient's pH was 7.28, is 7.48. And the PCO2 mm. is low. Mm. Okay, so this person is hyperventilating. Yes. So he's got a respiratory alkalosis. This is an acute situation. Look at it, it's, a, it's a trauma victim. Mm. So the situation in the clinical situation is an acute situation. He's brought in hyperventilating, okay. and he's he's got a comp and the, sorry. Uh, sorry, sir. That's a, some interruption. Oh, that doesn't matter. So in this patient, in contrast to the other patient. The pH is in the alkalotic side. He's hyperventilating, but he's also got a base excess, which is minus three. Looking at the trauma patient, it's likely to be a metabolic disorder first, unless he's got a chest injury. But any chest injury or anything should cause a high CO2, not a hyperventilation. So that is why he's got a respiratory alkalosis. Because the base excess is more negative, it's mild, he's got a metabolic acidosis. If I have not answered the query, feel free to ask again. The person who asked, please feel free to uh, comment on it whether you understood or not. Go ahead and ask again till you are sure that your doubts are clarified. This patient, in contrast to the previous patient, has got an acute situation. So starting with the clinical scenario, you look at the pH, it's 7.48, it's the alkalotic side. He's hyperventilating, CO2 is low. So he's definitely got a respiratory alkalosis. Maybe he's got pain, which is why he's hyperventilating, or whatever it is. Or maybe you got a fractured drip when he's hyperventilating. But he's also got a base excess, which is minus three, which is well, mildly acidotic. So he's got a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory alkalosis. Sure, sir. Understood. I, the person replied saying understood. Okay, good. So well, you must start with the clinical scenario. If you just look at the numbers, you can get to all sorts of weird uh, diagnosis. Always start with the number. Is it an acute situation or likely to be chronic? Is it a respiratory or a metabolic? So start like that, then you will find it makes sense. Of course, somebody can just look, ignore the history and ask you, can't it be something else? Go back, plant your uh, fundamental starting point as the clinical scenario. Sure. Uh, one more question on that was patient five. Five, okay. Isn't there a compensatory respiratory alkalosis? No, because this is a hyperglycemic patient with septic shock, starting with metabolic. If you start with the metabolic side of the spectrum, the expected compensation is the two digits of the pH after the decimal point plus minus five. So 7.14 plus five is 19, minus five is nine. This PCO2 is 15, is within the range of compensation. Now, compensation is not called a second disorder. Remember that. Mm. 
compensation is part of the process. So this patient has got a metabolic acidosis with compensation, correct? But it is not a second metabolic, it's not a respiratory alkalosis. If his PCO2 was 8, then I would have said he's got a lower than expected CO2 and he would be having a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory alkalosis. If his CO2 was 30, I would have said this person has got a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis because CO2 will be higher than you expect. Which is why you need to have the rules for expected compensation usable in your head. And the easiest one is the rule of the thumb for metabolic disorders and the base success for respiratory disorders. Yeah, so that's what I think. Uh, they just to emphasize on what you said, sir, about uh, acute compensation by respiratory is expected, but acute uh, compensation by renal is not ex correct. Not expected. Absolutely. That's absolutely that's correct. Right. I hope they understand that also in this context. Yeah, that is very important. Respiratory uh, system is like the hair, renal is like the tortoise. Uh, so there's uh, one more question. Uh, with the Zigard and Anderson approach, the second metabolic problem will be a compensatory process only, no, sir. Hold on, hold on. Which one I'm talking about? Which, sorry, which, which one are you talking about? Which patient? I think it's with respect to three and four, sir. No, no, we want to take one at a time. Put out, mix up everything together, you can't. No, the same person has asked it as a question, not referring yeah, yeah. to which. He's so, mentioned three and four. Three and four. Let's go back to three. Okay, three, what is the argument? No, they ask me with respect to a cigarette Anderson approach, second metabolic problem will be a compensatory process only, no? So, I think... Yes, 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 yes. You're right, it's compensated. But unless I know... If, uh, he's absolutely right that it is within the limits of compensation using the base excess method. But if you look at the standard and the actual bicarbonate, hmm. the actual bicarbonate is 31, the standard is 26. Correct? Mm. That is within normal. Which tells you that there is no second disorder. Yes. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Absolutely right. So if but if the person was also on frusamide, I would be a bit hesitant of saying that is just the compensation. Because if you for the pH to drop, it also means the base excess may have also dropped. I'm just picking on the points, that's all. See, for the pH to drop in a chronic disorder, mm. if his base excess was, say, uh, 8 or 9, his pH may not have dropped. Yes, sir. So the acute rise in CO2, there's not enough uh, base excess there to buffer the acute rise. So the base excess there is part of a compensatory process. I agree with that. So I can actually remove the metabolic alkalosis uh, from the... Uh, from the diagnostic box, but it is good to be aware of it. That helps you to diagnose a chronic respiratory problem. Yeah, that's it. Sure. So it's cleared from the. There was a request asking whether, uh, so if we can put up a patient one and two ABG slides to see the see okay. one. Second. Yeah, you are. So this is a patient who is coming with a respiratory problem. CO2 is slightly lower than the range I mentioned, 35 to 45. And he's also got a mild uh, metabolic acidosis because his base excess is minus 5 almost. So a pneumonia patient with mild metabolic acidosis. Or you can call it metabolic respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. Is that, a, of course, he's hypoxic. There's no question about that. So the PF ratio is bad. Is there any uh, clarification on this uh, needed? Not as of now, sir. Okay, good. Any on that? So it's a compensated metabolic. Compensated? No, this cannot be compensated because it's renal, isn't it? Serena, yes. Yeah, acute. so it is not it's acute onset that uh, it's a separate issue. It's a, there's a different metabolic acidosis beyond compensation. Yeah. Maybe it's septic. So maybe slide two also, patient. Yeah. 
Bien, yo. Any questions on this? Anyone, any questions? Or any questions on the lecture? Yeah, Take lecture can even wait till tomorrow. I have no problems. So I'll send you this, this slide right away. Anything else? Uh, I think uh, that's it. Anything in the lecture, main lecture, any immediate doubts? The previous lectures, if any questions, please feel free to ask your questions. I think uh, we uh, were happy to receive some quest, uh, queries with us for last lecture on the in the email also. Uh -huh. uh, the mail ID is mentioned here, met, met to at cmcvalor.ac.in. Yeah. Please feel free to ask further questions. and. Uh, I think we'll wind up for today, sir. Thank you. Please fill uh, please fill in the feedback form. The links have been forwarded, also mentioned in the chat box. Thanks again, sir. We'll meet, meet up back again tomorrow on uh, at twelve noon. At twelve noon tomorrow. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. We start off with this five uh, question number six to ten. Sure, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you.